So good morning. This is Chair Rita Moran. Pursuit to House Rule 10.01. I call this remote meeting of the House Ways and Means Committee to order. Ms. Sparkman, please take the roll for attendance. Chair Moran. Present. Moran, present. Vice Chair Olson. Present. Olson, present. Representative Garofalo. Present. Garofalo, present. Representative Albright. Present. Albright, present. Representative Becker Finn. Present. Becker Finn, present. Representative Bernardi. Present. Bernardi, present. Representative Eklund. Present. Eklund, present. Representative Hansen. Present. Hansen, present. Representative Hassan. Present. Hassan, present. Representative Hertos. Present. Hertos, present. Representative Hornstein. Present. Hornstein, present. Representative Johnson. Present. Johnson, present. Representative Cresha. Present. Cresha, present. Representative Liebling. Present. Liebling, present. Representative Lilly. Present. Lilly, present. Representative Mariani. Representative Mariani. Representative Marquardt. Marquardt, present. Marquardt, present. Representative Miller. Representative Miller. Representative Nash. Nash, present. Nash, present. Representative Nelson. Nelson, present. Nelson, present. Representative Noor. Noor, present. Noor, present. Representative O'Neill. O'Neill, present. O'Neill, present. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski, present. Pulowski, present. Representative Petersburg. Petersburg, present. Petersburg, present. Representative Pinto. Pinto, present. Pinto, present. Representative Schumacher. Schumacher, present. Schumacher, present. Representative Schultz. Schultz, present. Schultz, present. Representative Scott. Scott, present. Scott, present. Representative Sundin. Sundin, present. Sundin, present. Representative Mariani. Representative Miller. That concludes the role. There is a quorum present. Thank you, Ms. Sparkman. So a quorum is present. Our first agenda item is approval of the minutes from our hearing on Saturday, June the 19th. The minutes were included in the hearing documents emailed to you by committee staff. Are there any questions or corrections to the minutes? Uh, Vice Chair Olson, would you like to move the minutes? Uh, Madam Chair, it looks like Representative Garofalo has his hand up. I don't know if that's a correction or comment to the minutes. Oh, thank you, Vice Chair. Representative Garofalo. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. It's somewhat related to the minutes, but not completely. I'm just, I'm wondering if by the end of this month, now that we're meeting in session, if the committee is going to be meeting in person, are we going to be having any um, in-person meetings at all? Um, uh, Representative Garofalo, um, I don't see any in-person meetings, hearings in the near horizon. Okay, I can wait till after approval of the minutes, but I wanted to, I just wanted to find out what the, have a conversation about that. So I'll, I'll wait till adoption of the minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions in regards to the minutes? Okay, Vice Chair Olson, can we get you to approve the, move the uh, approval of the minutes? I uh, so move, Madam Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair Olson. Uh, moves approval of the minutes for June the 19th, 2021. Please unmute briefly for a voice vote. All in favor of approving the minutes say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. The motion prevails and the minutes are approved. So members, this morning, we will hear the budget agreement for the Environment and Natural Resource Omnibus, House File 5. We would then call a recess to keep the committee open in case other bills are ready for us to hear by the end of the day. To the bill, to the bill, I'm sorry, to the bill. 
Chair Hansen, you have two amendments. Would you like to move your bill and then proceed to your amendments? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I would move the House File 5 be recommended to be placed on the general register. And then I would move the DE amendment, the A21-0232 amendment. Okay. And then finally, I would move uh, the technical amendment uh, prepared by uh, nonpartisan staff to the DE amendment, the 1SS-H0005A1 amendment. This amendment reflects various technical and clarifying changes from the agencies and nonpartisan staff. Okay, um, Representative Hansom, just wondering, do you also have an A1 amendment to the amendment before us? That was the A1, the 1SS-H0005A1 amendment. So that's the one I would move uh, to, that's the amendment to the DE amendment. Okay. Uh, so let me, I'm sorry, um, I need to write that down because I don't have that amendment in my note. You know, we're getting to these final moments and everything is moving so fast and uh, or in last minute. So can I get that amendment again, uh, Representative Hansen? The 1SS-H0005A1 amendment. So is that the ASS-10015-A1? 1SS-H0005A1. Okay. I think that's think. what you were referring to as the A1 amendment. That's what I have as my. Yes. Okay. Um, so there are a couple hands up, I guess, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Let me just make sure I have that uh, amendment correct so that I can repeat it. So it's the ASS. One SS. One SS. I'm sorry. One SS. Dash. Dash. H. H for Harry. Yep. Okay. Zero 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 five. A one. Beautiful. So that the is the number one SS. Dash. Dash. H. Zero 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 five. Dash. A one. Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much for your patience with me this morning. Oh. Okay, so um, I see we do have a couple of hands. Representative Nash, we have a question. Yes, Madam Chair, if you could clarify, I heard the movement of two amendments and was just wondering which one we'll be taking up first since we can't actually move two amendments at the same time. Absolutely. So I'm thinking that we would take up the one SS dash H0005 A1 first. And we will discuss that and then we'll move the A21 uh, 0232. Madam Chair. Yes, Chris. Uh, just for clarity for members, uh, the A1 is a technical amendment that is drafted to the delete all A21 0232. So, Representative Hansen. Uh, move the delete all amendments and then move the A1 amendment to the amendment. So the A1 is before the committee at this time. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Um, Representative Nash, is that the clarity that you needed? Yes, Madam Chair. I was just trying to make sure that we didn't get uh, out over our skis since you can't do that. Uh, two amendments at once. I believe that you've got to take up the DE first and then make your amendment to the DE. So thank you. Thank you. Representative Albright. Aaron, along those same lines, I just want to reiterate what Mr. McCall just uh, mentioned. So as I would understand it for the members around the table or the Zoom call, the DE is now before the committee and then pursuant to that, Representative Hansen will pick up the technical amendment to the DE, adopt that, and then as the DE is amended, then we will discuss that. Is that what Representative Hansen and Mr. McCall confirm? I see Mr. Representative Hansen giving the thumbs up. I just want to make sure that that's taken in that parliamentary procedure protocol. We don't want to get off to a bad bad start this 
am so thankful for all the help and, and the expertise that we have in this committee uh, and the uh, collaboration to assure that we are doing, you know, the um, protocols and procedures as needed. So bear with me if, you know, I'm challenged here and take some time, but we will work through this, but I do appreciate the support and help of, of members. Okay. So, uh, on the technical amendment, Madam Chair, I would ask for the committee's support. Uh, um, it is technical and clarifying. Okay. So, um, bear with me. I have my notes here, so I'm hoping we can follow this. I know we, I hear some DEs, but we have the A1 amendment to the amendment before us. Um, and so before we vote on the A1, could you, uh, have you explained your A1 amendment, uh, Chair Hansen? Um, I explained it as technical. I think it's uh, it. pretty straightforward in front of the committee. Are there any questions to that? So if there's no further discussion, Chair Hansen renews his motion to adopt the A1 amendment to the amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. So members, we are back to the A21-0232 amendment as amended. Chair Hansen, do you have any additional comments before we go to questions for, from members? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to the DE amendment as amended by the technical amendment, the joint budget, budget target for the Environment, uh, Natural Resources, Finance and Policy Committee was set at 361.988 million from the general fund for FY 2022 and FY 23 biennium. This is 30 million above the base. This amount was increased by 3.5 million in order to accommodate additional requirements related to chronic wasting disease and farm survey day oversight. The target was further adjusted 1.591 million for the conservation officer salary increases, what which in legislative shorthand, we've been referring to as the MLEA uh, increases. Uh, the total general fund spending is 367.079 million, which is 35.091 million over the base. In total, the bill directly appropriates 993 million from all funds, including the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. Adding in the statutory and open appropriations, the amount appropriated is 1.66 billion. The budget, a uh, couple highlights, uh, and I understand that Senate Finance Committee is going to be meeting today. Uh, the outstanding issue that is still being discussed is how do we respond to the crisis of chronic waste and disease and the details related to that. But this represents the agreement with the Senate at the present. I'll just go quickly through some changes. In general, this bill is pretty much uh, uh, sim very similar to what we passed uh, off the House floor with some notice notable financial changes and a lot less policy changes. For the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, there are 1.998 million for local government water infrastructure grants. These will go out to help uh, prepare uh, communities for the advances in climate change that are affecting our communities. There is the operating adjustment for public employees, 128,000 for the green tier report, 600,000 for the PFAS source evaluation, 350,000 for the St. Louis River TMDL, 200,000 for the MLCAT uh, fund repayment, and 104,000 for the fee pass food packaging ban. For the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, there are 3 million for legal costs, of which 2 million may be transferred to the MPCA. There is 2.5 million for accelerated tree planting and 2.4 million for emerald ash borer, 1 million of coming from the Heritage Enhancement Account. I should note that this is one of the largest investments in trees uh, uh, that we've had in recent years. 3.984 million for the operating adjustment for public employees, uh, 300,000 for public safety response, 300,000 for a grant to the 
for the Red Lake Nation for Aquatic Invasive Species Response. 850,000 for Aquatic Invasive Species Prevention Grants. There is no watercraft surcharge. There are no fees in the bill. Uh, so we have got, we're dealing with EAB and AIS and CWD. One million for the University of Minnesota Aquatic Invasive uh, Center, no watercraft surcharge. 225,000 for the Hoffman Apiary, Apiaries, uh, that's a Senate provision. Two million increase for state parks. There is no state park fee increase, but the general fund is going to help uh, meet state parks cost. And with the passage of this bill, this ensures that the state parks will be open uh, starting on July 1st. You may remember there were threats to shut down our parks if certain policy provisions were not accepted. So not only with the passage of this bill, will the parks be open, but they will be getting some additional dollars to help maintain them and make them ready for Minnesotans. 3.5 million for chronic waste disease, including 1.5 million from the Heritage Enhancement Account. 3.5 million for, far, for the transition and coal management of farm survey. 600,000 for protecting digital assets for, for cybersecurity, a very important thing for the DNR. 400,000 for no child left inside. 500,000 from the heritage uh, enhancement account. Various Senate items, uh, projects, Lanesboro Dam, Blue Earth County stormwater, Medelia food uh, floodplain modeling, Waterville items, Bruce Mine Park, and a Masabi Trailhead, and again, the MLEA increases. For the Board of Water and Soil Resources, 1.35 million for soil health cover crops, 2 million for water storage implementation, practices to help keep water on the land, 1.4 million for septic replacement grants, and the operating adjustment. For Explore Minnesota Tourism, 1 million for community event grants and the operating adjustment. As we come out of COVID, it's important for communities and the, the events that we all treasure around the state to be able to have some uh, funds to appropriate, uh, to help promote those events for Minnesotans and people from outside Minnesota to attend and enjoy. Changes to the LCCMR bill. The FY22 LCCMR bill is as it passed the House and previously passed in Ways and Means. In the FY21 bill compared to what passed the House, the Teach Science Schools STEM Laboratories re was reduced to 118,000. 118,000 was added to lawns to legumes. In addition to the 61.387 million in resources that were available for FY21, a few other projects that otherwise would have been canceled to the corpus of the fund are transferred to new projects. These include a 2.768 million project in the house that was included in the bill and additional projects using 1.164 million. These, were used, these are cancellations in the Environment Natural Resource Trust Fund. So they're projects that uh, were uh, never completed or they had amounts that weren't completed and came back to the LCCMR uh, and the Environmental Trust Fund. So we, we captured those unspent dollars and we have appropriated those funds as followed. Unprecedented change uh, threatening pristine, Minnesota's pristine lakes, 482,000. Wastewater pond optimization, 700,000. NRI mineral and water resources, 700,000. Chloride pollution reduction, 500,000. Chronic wasting disease prion research in soils, 336,000. Lawns to legumes, 880,000. And then we uh, provide for a small emerging issues account of 284,000 uh, for the future. And that uh, members is a quick, relatively quick summary of the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Hansen. Uh, members, do you have any questions to the A21-0232 amendment before we adopt it? Okay, I see some hands. Uh, Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Rep Garofalo's hand was up first if he wanted to go first or maybe he wanted to summary. Yeah, uh, he usually wants to go last, but <laughs> Representative Garofalo. 
Um, Madam, Madam Chair, thank you, Representative Hurtas. Madam Chair, I just wanted to know if you wanted us to have debate on the uh, delete all amendment as amended, or if you wanted to adopt these amendments first before we take that up. Well, I, I would prefer that we adopt the um, um, amendment to the amendment and then debate it. Okay, I will wait until the author's amendments are uh, uh, adopted as amended, then I'll say my comments for then. But Madam Chair, I do wanna have a conversation about um, when we can anticipate us meeting in person here. So I'll just okay. float that again, thank you. All right, beautiful. Um, so why don't, uh, Representative Hurtas, would you like the same or are you ready to ask your questions now? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Chair Hanson, thanks for your overview. Um, I was shuffling some papers when you mentioned first about CWD. I've had about three constituent emails concerned about this issue. And I picked up that you uh, mentioned $336,000 uh, right at the end here for additional CWD. But you mentioned something about during the transition were the words you used. Can you uh, expand a little bit? Are, are we transitioning? Survey farms out of business is is that what I'm picking up or is it did you mean something else by that? Could you just talk a little bit more about CWD? Your hands. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Hurtas. Let me start with the last item first. The three hundred thirty-six thousand is money to the University of Minnesota uh, for research on how long the prions last in the CWD prions last in soil. Um, about. And I'm losing a little bit of track of time here. About a week ago, uh, the LCCMR had a meeting where we heard presentations from the, uh, the University of Minnesota and uh, appropriated money, remaining money from the Emerging Issues account to them for research. Uh, this is additional dollars for that research. So that's the research component. The millions of dollars that are provided, you may remember on the when we passed off the House floor, there was a large number of policy provisions, including a moratorium on new deer farms, uh, uh, fencing requirements, uh, identification on ear tags, um, a variety of uh, not having a farm served back on a site that had been contaminated uh, with the prions uh, and had been depopulated for 10 years. There were a number of those policy positions the Senate refused all of those policy positions. What's currently being discussed is co-management between the Department of Natural Resources and the Board of Animal Health. And with uh, additional dollars to manage that response. So uh, in the last month uh, or six weeks, there has been dramatic increase in the number of sites that have of far, deer farms that have had a chronic waste and disease. And to protect the wild herd, there will have to be additional um, response outside the fence. Uh, I'm quite familiar with the response outside the fence uh, in southeastern Minnesota. There's going to have to be zones around those farms. Uh, and it's now going to be up in the pine trees. It's up north. And so there's the response to chronic waste and disease that the DNR will be doing and has been doing that is gonna cost a lot of money. And then how do we deal with these deer farms and tracing contamination uh, on site? How are inspections and enforcement done? And what has been uh, and is currently being discussed at uh, the governor and the majority, Senate majority leader and the speaker is how that uh, co-management will occur. And that is what we're waiting for, but the funds are there. Uh, the policy provisions that were passed the House were rejected as were almost all policy positions from the House by the, by the Minnesota Senate. Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Chair Hansen, for explaining that. <clears throat> are you, when you were uh, using the term during this transition, just uh, referring to the ongoing negotiations about how survey day farms are gonna be managed or is there um, some bigger end goal that, that I'm not understanding? Sheer Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Hurtas. That would be the co-management uh, if that is what uh, is, we're finally going to be uh, considering. 
Representative. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Representative uh, Eklund. Representative Eklund. Sorry, Madam Chair, after all this time, I still forgot to unmute myself. But anyway, uh, uh, thank you, Chair Hanson. Uh, Representative Hurtas, uh question was exactly what I was going to ask, and I think that was a, a good explanation. Uh, I, th I think it's unfortunate that that the Senate would not take our policy on this on these CWD provisions. Uh, and I, we're going to have to get the outside groups to apply more pressure and, and work harder on this issue going forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was wondering if Chair Hansen would go through some of the changes. Uh, I You went through some of them, but um, I'm looking at my brief and there's quite a few new policies that you didn't mention. For example, um, the light geese um, hunting license for 250, the Sandhill crane license for $3, um, establishing a $3.50 fee for apprenticeship hunter validation. There's there's quite a few things that you didn't mention. I'm just wondering if you could go through what the new policies were and some of the major things that were not in there, like California cars. Chair Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Representative O'Neill. Those were the DNR policy provisions. Uh, we adopted the same and similar uh, policy provisions uh, and the two lands bills. So uh, those were voted on, uh, I think, even um, by ways and means and, and the House floor. So we had uh, the three policy provisions of the House that were adopted were, um, in addition to same and similar, were uh, the GAR, so the DNR commissioner uh, who is on uh, this call or in this on this Zoom has the authority now to set seasons on GAR, and that is um, different. Uh, so it's not an unlimited take on uh, this prehistoric fish. The PFAS uh, food packaging ban, which was uh, Representative Wozlawick's bill and went through the process, that was not same and similar, and that was accepted by the Senate. And then uh, the MPCA land, what was the, two, the 2020 MPCA lands bill uh, was uh, adopted as well. So those were the three policy provisions uh, that were adopted beyond the same and similar. Uh, but the provisions you're talking about with the various fees, those were in the, in the policy bill that uh, was same and similar. The uh, Senate uh, did not prevail on uh, a delay in the clean car emissions rule. Uh, so that will go forward. Uh, I think an important thing to recognize here is that uh, at, at the end of the day, there's a lot of compromise and uh, the House gave up a lot of its policy, uh, but the Senate uh, gave up the clean car uh, uh, delay. Um, I think a real positive thing was we were able to bring the LCCMR back to uh, its original recommendations and were able to capture some of the funds that otherwise would have gone back to the corpus to spend those on very worthy projects. So the conflict that has gripped the LCCMR for several years, um, I think that hopefully this will end that uh, and uh, uh, we can move forward uh, where this Legislative Citizens Commission on Minnesota Resources recommendations uh, can vet those projects and we can move them uh, individually rather than having them held up uh, in an overall budget process. I don't know if that's helpful, uh, Representative O'Neill. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And when is the enactment date for the California car emissions? Chair Hansen. Um, I believe that Commissioner Bishop is on and she could give an update after the, as to uh, the impact of the administrative law judge uh, rulemaking so we can get that accurately on the record. Commissioner Bishop, please introduce yourself for the record and then proceed. Hello. 
Hello, Madam Chair uh, and members of the committee. I'm Laura Bishop, the Commissioner of the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Uh, thank you. And you had asked about the uh, enactment date. Um, so the implementation, what would happen is, you know, the rulemaking now goes into, you know, final rulemaking. It would be published in the state register and uh, it would not be implemented till July 1st, I mean, January 1st, 2024. So uh, the first uh, car make models that would be subject to this would be uh, F or model year 2025. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair, that's all I have right now. All right, thank you. Uh, Representative uh, Lilly. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Chair Hanson. So um, just a, a question related to the LCCMR. So, uh, so, so these are two years of funds, right? You're saying? So um, my understanding is from what you're saying is the Senate's held it up for two years. I mean, that just, so this is a citizen it's a legislative group. Representative Lilly, you're going in and out. All, uh, all those projects are just in there waiting. Hold on just a second. Yeah. Uh, Representative Lilly, you went in and out um, as you was commenting. So you may need to repeat your question to Chair Hansen. I think Hansen? I got it. You I got think it? I got it, Madam. Okay, what's Chair Hansen? Representative Lilly is correct. Uh, you know, um, kind of referencing back to Representative O'Neill's question, uh, the Senate held up the DNR policy, the DNR lands bill, uh, the PCA lands bill, and the LCCMR, and we, we need to pass this bill because if we don't pass this bill by midnight on June 30th, over $60 million, all those projects that I just uh, mentioned, all those uh, opportunities for high quality research and implementation, those disappear because the 2020, what we refer to as the 2020 LCCMR was held up a year. And then we have the 2021, which were, we worked all last summer and fall on preparing those recommendations. So the Senate delay of holding up those projects has made it critical that we get this deal done because we've got to get this bill passed. Otherwise, that money goes back to the corpus. It doesn't get forwarded. And I think Representative Lilly is in the unique position of having served on both LCCMR and LSOHC. That funds, those funds do not get forwarded, they disappear. So it is a re really big deal that we were able to uh, achieve compromise on getting that 2020 bill uh, restored and able to capture some funds that would have been canceled and lost to use on worthy projects. And I, I see that as a major accomplishment uh, in this bill. And uh, hopefully we can get this bill off the floor and get it passed and uh, signed into law so that uh, the work can begin. begin. Representative Lilly. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Moran, and uh, thank you, Chair Hanson. I'm I'm just shocked. It's uh, it's just sad to me that these projects that are vetted by uh, the citizens and legislators uh, have just sat there. And uh, I mean, there's just um, amazing projects. I remember when I did serve on it, there was one that we were buying land on the St. Croix River, not in my district or anything, but uh, Senator Housley and I were working on it. And I mean, just to think that there's a bunch of those projects that might go away or be missed, it's uh, it's really sad for our state. Thank you, Representative Hanson. Yeah. Uh, Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to clarify, uh, especially I think for the public's benefit, since a lot of folks are paying attention to what's going on with chronic wasting disease. Um, so the what there are many different provisions in the bill dealing with chronic wasting disease. Some of those are funding to the DNR so that they can carry out their work. Uh, it costs a lot of money to deal with the aftermath of uh, positive chronic wasting disease uh, cases. Uh, 
and then because of the LCCMR bills being included in here, there's funding to the U of M for the work, really important um, groundbreaking work that they are doing uh, in different ways of testing and monitoring and learning more about chronic wasting disease. And then also uh, importantly, we, the house uh, position had been to seek changing authority for the oversight of white-tailed deer uh, farms uh, to, uh, to the DNR from the Board of Animal Health. What is included in this compromise bill is concurrent authority uh, so that the DNR could regulate and monitor, monitor as, as well as the Board of Animal Health. So that is the language that's in this bill. Um, not as strong as what many of us would have liked to see, but I, I do think it's important that that's noted because uh, you know I know I've been hearing from a lot of folks uh, wondering what the status is regarding that. So that's just, I wanted to give that further update on uh, chronic wasting disease provisions in the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair becker <clears throat> Representative Neal, you have another question? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I was just going through the language just a little bit. And I'm wondering if Chair Hansen could explain the difference, because it looks like there's a difference between the original bill and this bill with the conservation officer's salary changes. And my last question, so I get them all out, is who is in the room negotiating the bill? Chair Hansen. Uh, and maybe I could have a, a nonpartisan fiscal staff describe uh, the MLEA changes because the longer we go away from last October, there had to be adjustments for the repayment. Um, that's one issue. And I think there were, there was debate about whether these would be carried in one separate bill or an individual bill. So as you know, Representative O'Neill, there are things in commerce, there are things here, there, there are provisions under the, under the MLDA contracts that are in various agencies. So Mr. Marks, if you could uh, maybe describe uh, how, how, where we're at here with MLEA. Mr. Marks, please introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, Madam Chair, Bill Marks, uh, fiscal staff, uh, the, uh, and Representative O'Neill, the uh, the House bill originally had uh, salary increases for uh, the various law enforcement officers. The Environment bill had the conservation officers in it. Uh, the agreement uh, uh, took the Senate uh, proposal, which had uh, some additional language dealing with supervisors and managers, and uh, and then the more recent development is there's a tentative contract now with the law enforcement association. So there's language in here saying that uh, the increases that are in the bill include increases that uh, may have been negotiated in the contract. We don't know what's in the contract. That's not public information yet, but uh, that language has been added as well. And as Representative Hansen has stated, there's, there's language for the law enforcement officers in the environment bill, in the commerce bill, in the transportation bill and in the public safety bill. Representative O'Neill. Yes, as the former SCR chair, I'm aware that there are law enforcement uh, employees essentially scattered throughout different state budgets. Um, and so then the final question, if Chair Hansen would weigh in as who actually was in the room negotiating the bill. Chair Hansen. Well, thank you, Representative O'Neill. Uh, uh, it was very hard to get anybody in the room. Uh, uh, Senator Inger Britson and I were in the physical room with uh, a number of the state agency commissioners and fiscal staff, I think two or three times. And other than that, it was virtual. And as you know, uh, uh, Senator Inger Britson uh, went to Alaska. So it was uh, difficult to be in the room, uh, but we were able to virtually accommodate that uh, this was very, 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 very difficult negotiation. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair Hansen. Um, and what, how much of a, a role did the commissioners play in the negotiations of this bill? I know that commissioners have had varying roles. Some were there more as advisory and some were actually making offers uh, to from the House to the Senate, kind of um, brokering those deals. And so I'm just wondering, the commissioners that were involved, and obviously there's more than one commissioner because you've got a lot of areas here, but 
what kind of role did the commissioners play in the negotiations? And the reason I asked this question is because this was all done behind closed doors and the public really wants to know how did these bills come to be? Chair Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative O'Neill. So I think our, our area was a little bit unique because we have so many agencies and um, the DNR commissioner, PCA commissioner, the executive director of the Board of Water and Soil Resources <coughs> were primarily involved. Um, and then we had uh, our staff uh, working on sending offers back and forth. Um, so there was involvement, but it is uh, the role of the House and the Senate to negotiate. And uh, I think you could ask the commissioners um, that I was very adamant that the legislature writes the budget that the legislature uh, has the authority. And uh, um, I was very blunt and you'd probably uh, 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 agree with me, Representative O'Neill, um, but we were very clear that the legislature writes the budget and it's important that, um, you know, where their input is there. And just as an example, uh, you know, the action that we've taken in this committee so far they've caught that they were able to catch the technical errors that were in the bill. And so I think that's really a, a role. Um, there are really uh, two issues that are that were discussed at a higher level. And those were the manure um, rulemaking that came over. Representative Sundin's probably smiling because that somehow ended up in my bill uh, and not in his. And uh, uh, the CWD, which as we discussed is ongoing. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair Hansen. No, I agree with you wholeheartedly that it is the legislature's responsibility to enact or, or to put forth a budget and policy and, you know, the commissioners can offer advice, but it is our role and our constitutional duty to do that. So I appreciate that you also have that view um, not all the chairs through this process have had that view, and I do hope that more of them adopt that view that it is absolutely the legislature's role to do that. So thank you, Madam Chair and Chair Hanson. Representative Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chair Hanson, um, on the increase in conservation officers, can you give me a number of how many more conservation officer FTEs there will be. Um, if, if I understood right, there's maybe I misunderstood, but there's money in this bill, but then other bills related to that. So do you have a fix on the increase in FTEs of conservation officers from uh, before, I guess you would say this session until until after everything is proposed is, is approved? Chair Hansen. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair and Representative Miller. Uh, uh, Commissioner Stroman is on, but I I'll just go back to say the MLEA contract are for the uh, salary adjustments for existing conservation officers. Uh, Commissioner Madam Stroman. Chair. Oh, I'll go ahead. Commissioner Stroman, are you able to respond to Representative Miller's question? Sure, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Sarah Stroman. I'm the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Um, and I will ask Assistant Commissioner um, Bob Meyer to, to correct me if I'm, I misspeak here since he is, uh, oversees this division. But as Representative Hansen said, this funding is for the salary increases for our existing complement of conservation officers. This is not to increase the number of conservation officers. Representative Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I understood there was that in the portion and I and I fully confess I haven't poured through the bill yet. Um, long hours the last several days. I will look into this, I was just hoping. So I, I thought there was a distinction though that there's an, there's an increase in, in officers' pays, but based on what you were talking about with the, with, um, Servid farms or with some other things there was going to be increased activity with conservation officers so i thought i also heard that there was also approval of increased numbers of uh, conservation officers i'm just wondering if that's the case and if so um what how many what that number is 
Um, Commissioner Sherman, are there any additional conservation officers been hired? Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, to Representative Miller's question, I think as, as Chair Hansen explained the language, um, what it does is to provide concurrent authority to the Board of Animal Health and to the Department of Natural Resources. We will then need to work with um, the Board of Animal Resources through uh, amendments to our existing memorandum of understanding to figure out how we um, you know, appropriately staff those. So I, I think it remains to be seen um, what type of staffing arrangement uh, it is and whether we need additional conservation officers or it's additional uh, inspectors. And those, those are not necessarily the, the same people. Representative Miller. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair, that's it. Thank you. Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Moran, uh, Representative Hansen. I also noticed going through the bill late last night and uh, early this morning uh, that there's some uh, quite a few, a number of changes to the uh, closed landfill investment fund. I was wondering if you could explain the uh, new statutory appropriations and, uh, and the changes on the policy. Representative Hansen, Chair Hansen. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Johnson. So this was uh, an area where I think it was, I'd call it good old fashioned uh, negotiating on different approaches. The, the MPCA uh, originally proposed uh, providing uh, authority to access the closed landfill fund uh, on a very broad and general uh, terms. Uh, the, as you know, the closed landfill fund now is available to help with cleanup. Uh, the Senate had a different approach and was looking at spending a percentage of the corpus uh, or allowing the spending of a percentage of the corpus uh, to the MPCA with some ability for emergency funding. The House took a different provi uh, provision. What we passed off the floor was temporary authority spending the interest on the closed landfill account. As we were negotiating, we felt it was important to actually do a direct appropriation and then have that appropriation authority end after a period of time so that we could see how it was working, but also allow in the case of an emergency that there would be more money available uh, from the closed landfill fund. If there is, let's say there was a discovery at a closed landfill of, of an immediate life-threatening uh, contamination that needed to be addressed, and the legislature is not in session. That's the challenge of the status quo, is if the legislature is not in session without the ability to have the appropriations, uh, the MPCA has got their hands tied. So what prevailed was actually the House provision, which allows for the corpus to grow rather than taking a percentage uh, off the top. We would be, uh, we would know exactly how much is being appropriated because the legislature is making that choice. Uh, and then we would have that ability uh, for review following that. I should note that landfills are uh, a sleeping giant uh, in terms of an environmental problem uh, here in Minnesota and around the country. And uh, the PFAS contamination that is being found at landfills is just, I think, a tip of the iceberg in terms of what we're going to find at these sites. Um, I would note a very small appropriation that MLCAT repayment is important to help repay uh, funds that were taken you know, 15 years ago to balance the budget, state budget. But I look forward to robust landfill discussions in the future. I know it's not that exciting, but it's certainly, we all produce waste and we've got to be able to deal with the legacy of uh, these sites uh, as our options for waste management become limited. Representative Johnson. Uh, thank you, Representative Hansen, for the explanation. Okay. Okay, I don't see, I, I see you, Representative Garofalo, um, but other than that, is there any further discussion to the amendment? Madam Chair. Representative Hansen. I do wanna make a one point to highlight. I, I briefly discussed the manure provision and I think it's important uh, this is a provision that the Senate uh, uh, demanded and uh, had to be accepted. And I, I have great concerns about 
this uh, amendment. Again, I stated earlier, we wanna make sure that Minnesota's outdoor recreation opportunities are open on July 1st. Um, and I recognize the opportunity for, for compromise, but I think uh, the manure provision after a permit has, a general permit has been approved uh, is taking a great risk with the federal government and the EPA. And uh, we could lose uh, primacy on the authority the delegated authority that comes to the PCA uh, if the legislature continues to insert itself in uh, basic soil and water protection. Um, I think Representative Garofalo had a question or do you wanna just adopt the DE? Yes, why don't we adopt it? So it, there's, I don't see any further discussion to the amendment. Um, so Chair Hansen renews his motion to adopt the A21-0232 author's amendment as amended. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? No. The, motion, the motion prevails and the amendment as amended is adopted. Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And first of all, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so are we gonna be taking any um, testimony on this bill today? There is no um, testifiers to this bill, no. And Madam Chair, are there no testifiers because we're not allowing it or because no one wants to speak on it? Um, it's, Madam, Madam Chair, I think traditionally there has, uh, the Ways and Means Committee does not take that's testimony. That's true, absolutely. You're so true. And I think Representative Garofalo knows that traditionally. No, I mean, Madam Chair and Representative Hansen, actually our house rules prescribe that we must allow uh, public testimony. Uh, this, the remote hearing in response to the pandemic has kind of changed that. But um, the reason why I'm asking is number one, we're, you know, we're hearing from legislators and we're hearing from the government in terms of the commissioner's office, but the people impacted by this bill, um, we're not affording them the opportunity to have a dialogue with us and explain to us. And so Representative Hansen, um, I think you've had people contact you uh, with a specific provision uh, that there's concerns with in this bill. Um, I guess the, the first question I would have for you, Representative Hansen, is, is there is there an agreement between the House and the Senate um, on this bill that's presented to us today? Chair Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, uh, Representative Garofalo. The Senate and the House have posted the bill. Um, the provision that is my understanding that is still being discussed are the details on the CWD, on the chronic wasting disease. Representative Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Hansen. Uh, on page 113 of the bill, this is Article 2, Section 105, the, the food packaging uh, PFAs. Can you just, um, from your perspective, uh, explain to the committee the history of this language? And then since we're not allowed to hear from the concerns from those in the community on this, can you describe what concerns that they've raised regarding uh, this section of the bill? Chair Hansen. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Garofalo. So this is the PFAS and food packaging provision. And I mentioned earlier, there were three policy provisions that uh, the Senate accepted from the House. This provision, uh, Representative Garofalo, you may remember there was a bill introduced actually by former Representative Claflin uh, uh, three years ago, and then, uh, was then was introduced by Representative Wislawick it was introduced and heard in the uh, in the House. Uh, it went through several committees and it passed off the House floor. Um, and it was agreed to between Senator Ingebrigtsen and I uh, 10 days ago, roughly, uh, that we would that uh, the Senate would accept that language. So uh, that language uh, is the same as what passed off the House floor. Um, it simply and it and it, but it actually has a later implementation date. We acceded to the Senate's request, and we it has an implementation date of January 1, 2025. So uh, a couple of nights ago, I was contacted by 3M lobbyist who was concerned about the language in the bill and that it did not have a provision that said. Uh, um, that the, the protection for the industry mm. of saying that 
it will be intentionally added that the prohibition would be on intentionally added PFAS and food packaging. I think it's important to bring it back to, I, I don't think Minnesotans know that PFAS is in their food packaging. And I don't think Minnesotans want PFAS in their food packaging. And I think Minnesotans would think that the bright and smart industries that we have in our state and around the country could figure out a way of making food packaging without PFAS. We had actually proposed in the negotiations an earlier implementation date so that baby and toddler food packaging uh, bans would go into effect on 2023. And the Senate rejected those provisions. So we felt that the January 1, 2025, even though it's three years out, would give enough time and it's important thing to protect Minnesotans. PFAS is not a naturally occurring compound. It's showing up in our landfills now. And we can take preventive action on removing it from the packaging of the food we eat. And so, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and um, uh, Representative Hanson. So, to be clear, it is your intent, regardless of uh, there's a spectrum of PFAs that are available that you call them PFAs, but I call them PFAs. Um, there's a spectrum of PFAs out there in terms of safe versus unsafe. It is your intent to ban any and all trace of PFAs from any food packaging. That that it's not a that wasn't a drafting oversight. That is your intent. Sure. That is, that isn't, that's the bill that was introduced and it was heard and went through committee and was passed off the House floor. Yes, and the language, on, the language sure. on the substance does not change. But, Ma Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Hanson. Just to be clear though, what I stated as your intent, this, it is your intent to eliminate any and all PFAs, even trace amounts from any food packaging. Chair Hanson. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, and so, Madam Chair, with this issue, we've been um, contacted by at least I've been contacted by um, numerous uh, businesses in the state of Minnesota, Fortune 500 companies, responsible Fortune 500 companies that have a long and strong record of environmental stewardship and responsible corporate citizenship, saying that this language is problematic, that it's not as drafted uh, for various reasons, um, you know, and this is part of one of the downsides of legislating remotely, is that they're unable to uh, communicate these concerns or have this dialogue during committee hearings. And the net effect of what we're being told by stakeholders is that this is actually going to ban uh, these types of food packaging. Um, uh, we just heard this from Representative Hansen. Um, I don't think it's a good, I mean, I guess from a, sometimes I like letting you guys win so people can see when you guys overreach, uh, it kind of sounds like on this one, that was just an honest mistake that people, uh, a version of this bill changed previously and that it's going to need to be corrected at some point, whether that's now or in the future, uh, the, um, that when stakeholders signed off on this language, uh, they were under the mistaken impression that it was the original language, not not amended language. Um, but Representative Hansen, I, I, from what we're being told, um, this does sound like it's pretty problematic language that would be, I guess from your perspective, you would call it nation leading. Uh, it would be, uh, from other people's perspectives, unprecedented. And I guess I should, I should confirm that on the record that there is no other state that has this language in terms of a complete and absolute prohibition of all PFAs uh, even trace amounts in food packaging, that there's there's no other states that do that. Is is that correct? Chair Hansen. Madam Chair and uh, Representative Garofalo, um, as you know, the state of Connecticut recently passed a ban with the language on intentionally added uh, in there um, by providing the intentionally added uh, clause that what that does is it provides a shield for industry in terms of accountability and responsibility uh, in terms of this product. Again, there is no naturally occurring 
PFAS. It's created. And uh, this would be nation leading. Um, it was introduced, it was heard, it had gone through committees. I'm not sure what you're saying about sign off by industry, um, but this is something that went through the process and is in front of us and uh, is important. You know, we, we have um, a lot of chemicals that are that we have dealt with in Minnesota and have tried to deal with around the country. And all you have to do is just search on PFAS and the activities that are occurring in the states and in the US government trying to resolve this contamination from the forever chemicals that will last forever. So how do you, and there are a variety, I know my chemistry, uh, Representative Garofalo, there are a variety of PFAS compounds. There are also a variety of PFAS break breakdown products. But you have a three year window here, or more, three and a half years, to try to find a way to make the food packaging without PFAS. Representative Garofalo. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and again, um, Representative Hansen, I want to just thank you for the work you put in uh, this session and for. Uh, um, sharing your opinions on the stuff. Um, I, I am sharing with you what people are telling me and I take them at uh, their face value that number one, uh, there is not an agreement on your bill, uh, that the language that's in front of you, that uh, people, um, that previous agreements that were made uh, were done with a misunderstanding and that people want those issues corrected. Um, I've been in the chair that you're in before where you have an omnibus bill that uh, there's uncertainty about whether there's agreement on it or not. Um, I think so. I just I think it's important for members of the committee to understand that that there is there are disputes there are open disputes with this bill. It is not uh, to use a word uh, locked down or closed up. Uh, the second thing is with regards to section 105 of the bill that there are serious stakeholder concerns and um, it doesn't regardless of the issue when we're doing something on banning stuff that not even California has done. Uh, that kind of tells me that maybe we have some very well-intentioned policy here with some potentially uh, adverse effects that we haven't thought about. Um, so again, uh, I, I, th I feel like I understand what happened in this process is uh, the language was switched and people did not realize it and they didn't realize it until you know the last week and a half. But that's something that maybe you or the leadership tribunal will be taking care of in the um, the days and perhaps weeks ahead. So uh, I'll be voting no on your bill today. I would encourage members of the committee to vote no on the bill as well. And then uh, as soon as you have an update on your communications with the Senate on if and whether there's an agreement on this bill, if you could uh, if either update members of the chamber or update me, uh, that would be uh, that would be appreciated. But as always, Representative Hansen, thank you for, uh, for your work that you do in the legislature. Uh, but again, I'll be voting no. Thank you. Let me just state that I am not an environmentalist, but this has really perked my ears. And I wanna know more about the, the, the PFA and the uh, PFAS. Um, Cause I clearly heard Chair Hanson said that this passed out of committee and off the house floor. And there was definitely time for input from the industry and others to share their thoughts and opinion and expertise. But more okay. importantly, if there's something out there that's contaminating our packaging, I, I, you know, it, it needs to be dealt with. So I'm definitely going to do some more homework on this to see where we are in this process. Uh, Chair Madam, Madam Chair, before you go into the next call, if I, if I could just, I, I brought this up three times Re before. Representative Garofalo. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate your, um, and just on the PFAs issue, I want to make sure people understand that the bill as it was introduced is different than the bill that was included in the omnibus bill and then was subsequently went through the process that I, I, I just think that there was a very small technical change, you know, missing one word that's, you know, or a phrase there involving intentionally. And that's where, that's where this is coming from is that when that change was made, um, I actually went out last night and listened to the committee hearing um, for when this bill was introduced. No one mentioned that change in the language from the introduction to um, its insertion in the bill. So it was just missed by a lot of people until recently. I think there's just an honest disagreement about whether um, what the conferees or what the chairs agreed to 
was meant to include the intentional language or not. But th this is sort of a symptom of a bigger problem, Madam Chair, and that is that um, there really is no reason for us not to be meeting in person right now. I feel like this is exactly the kind of conversation that if we were sitting in a committee room and we were looking at each other, we could get, the, we, this is the kind of thing that could get resolved very quickly. Um, none of the committees in the house are meeting right now in person. Um, I understand that, but our committee is actually taking formal work and taking formal votes. Is is sort of this not meeting in person, is that is that coming from leadership or do you have some discretion and can we can we lobby you for, in this final week before June 30th, can we can we ha be open to the possibility of having some in-person hearings here and getting the, the public involved? Representative Agrafalo, um, I, I think um, right now where we are in this process that's, that's moving so quickly, you know, trying to come to some type of conclusion and agreement with the Senate. Um, that, and, you know, as you know, we were supposed to meet yesterday, but because of the floor session, here we are this morning. So it is moving really quickly. And the, the thing about, you know, uh, I, I'd love to be in person. You know, I think being able to read people and see people face to face is hugely important. But we are now in this process where things are really critically moving very quickly, especially for ways and means at this moment. And this really creates an opportunity for us who are at home across the state of Minnesota to be at um, to to be present at the moment quickly. And so, uh, for that reason, as as chair, I just think right now at this moment where we are in time in this legislative process that this is the best um, solution at this moment. Um, Madam Chair, can you elaborate on that, please? Like, so if we were at the Capitol, why would we, why would it be any slower? Well, the, the, the question is, we're not at the Capitol. You know, we are in this virtual, we, we're at home. You know, and we don't know. I, I can't tell you that, you know, tomorrow or this evening at 6.30, I, I mean, we can call it and people can just stand, sit around and wait whether or not, but that, you know, uh, has not been my preference at this moment. And so um, I, I get you, I hear you, you know, and in a lot of ways, you know, I value the in-person meetings, but in this process where we are right now at this moment, you know, we're gonna leave, you know, we're gonna be in recess for the rest of the day. We're not even gonna close out because we have bills that are still moving and still been negotiating that needs to come back to ways and means. And there needs to be a, a, a within a moment notice that we are present. And it really opens up a great opportunity for folks from not only locally, but from across the state or across the world to also chime in, to hear and listen to what we're doing. So it, it has a purpose in the process. Well, Madam Chair, we do have the opportunity. I mean, we do broadcast our hearings at the Capitol. It seems to me that the technology we're using right now is one way where uh, people, participants, stakeholders, they can listen to us, but they can't speak to us. Whereas when we're in person, we do have that opportunity to not only share what we're thinking with others, but also to listen to others. And that is a way for us to, um, that's a, a way for us to avoid some of the problems we've seen at, uh, with these bills. So. I guess I, I don't I do I do not understand the benefit to us continuing to be meeting Zoom as opposed to in person. Um, certainly, that's that's not the the policy the leadership tribunal has taken. They've been meeting in person, and I think if it's good enough for the leadership tribunal, it should be good enough for the people of Minnesota. Not that you need to hear testimony from every single stakeholder. That's certainly your your prerogative, but you are the only committee, this is the only committee that's meeting right now, uh, taking formal votes. The other committees are doing informational hearings. And I, I guess I don't, it sounds like this is your choice that it's not like leadership has forced you to do this, but I just, I would, I, I would question whether if this is signaling to us a permanent change that we are now, even after June 30th and in the interim, this is how committee hearings will be conducted. Um, that I just want to state my objections to that, and specifically uh, for the entire Republican caucus, um, we want to be meeting in person. We think it's better, particularly since the Capitol was closed for all this year, and these hearings should be happening in person, and um, that's going to expand access. That's going to expand visibility. We're still going to be broadcasting these hearings, 
on TV. I'm not, I'm not aware of any reason why we shouldn't be doing that, Madam Chair. I hear you, uh, Representative Garofalo. Um, and, um, you know, that is something to think about and maybe even um, consider. Um, it is not the, the leadership saying to me that you should not meet in person. That just doesn't make sense, you know, for them to even suggest that or state that or kind of like demand that. And I do know a lot of those tribunal, as you state, meetings are not all in person. They are through Zoom. And so um, we can't predict the future, what tomorrow holds, but at this moment, this is where we are. And we'll see. Uh, Chair Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so to, to bring us back to the bill, I, I do think it's important to remind folks that these, these PFAS chemicals, we have um, we have banned them in, in other products already, um, and the, the sky has not fallen. Uh, and these chemicals we know uh, accumulate in the body over time, particularly if you ingest them, and uh, they can cause cancer, disrupt your uh, thyroid and hormones, cause low birth weights, you know, kind of a, a long list of bad things that can happen from toxic chemicals and why this is important. Um, as far as the symptom of a bigger problem, I think that the the symptom of a bigger problem here is that uh, a lobbyist doesn't like something. And so they are trying to disrupt something that has been agreed to. And I think that is, uh, that's actually a bigger problem than any, than any other problem. You know, as, as noted earlier by, by Chair Hansen, we are the ones who make the laws and we can use the word stakeholder and it's a little bit nicer than using the word lobbyist, but um, it's, it's the same thing with, uh, you know, sort of getting uh, somebody weighing in and thinking they should be part of drafting the language and the reality is that we are the legislature and we are the ones who draft the language and not all of the stakeholders or lobbyists or outside groups are always going to be happy with every single thing that we do but that doesn't mean that what we're doing isn't the right thing. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad that this is included and I think it is what the public wants. Um, you know, this is our food packaging. This is directly related to the things that we, uh, we drink and eat and we want to keep, um, keep our citizens healthy. Uh, you know, we don't need a repeat of what's happened in the East Metro or the Bemidji area with um, poisoning the water. And it, it's, this is the right thing to do. And uh, folks should be glad that this is included and that we can vote for it. Thank you, Madam Thank you. Chair. Thank you, Chair Becker Fan, for that information. Um, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I just, I just want to go on the record as saying you know, I couldn't disagree with you more on this transparency and meeting in person issue. There's absolutely zero reason that we cannot be meeting in person. I think when you get really down to this whole thing is that this Zoom stuff has made legislators lazy. They don't want to come in um, because it's inconvenient. And um and it's it's the I I feel for the public right now because they're getting a raw deal. Um, you know there are our stakeholders, lobbyists, whatever, on both sides of every issue at the Capitol, and for both of those sides or you know multiple sides not to be able to come in and face to face present their um, concerns or their support for legislation is giving the public in general a raw deal. The, the bills that we're passing, in my opinion this year, have not necessarily been well vetted because of this Zoom process. And if you look around the country, things are opened up. If you look around Minnesota, things are opened up. There's no safety reason for most of us that we can't be there in person. Um, I think it's a, a huge injustice. And as Representative Garofalo um, alluded, I hope this isn't a, a vision of things to come because in fact, if, if maybe we'll introduce bills that say, you know, going forward, we're just not gonna do this unless there's a really, really good reason, uh, an emergency, because the emergency is over. And um, so let's be transparent. I remember Representative Hansen speaking on transparency in the past. And um, 
Madam Chair, I just urge you to reconsider your position on this. Um, we need to be meeting in person. Thank you. Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'd like to bring to members' attention a vote that we all cast on the rules of the House earlier uh, this session. And in rules, Representative Winkler took on a, an amendment that I had offered, which was to allow the public to offer testimony in committee. It didn't say which committees, it said all committees. So this committee would fall under that rule by not even making it uh, uh, available for people to offer testimony. And I have, like Representative Garofalo, received commentary, not necessarily from lobbyists, but from people, regular old people. They have an opinion. Some of them are in favor of this. Some of them are against this. But you know what we're lacking? Their voice. That's what we're lacking. We will not be hearing them today because the majority party has decided that they don't want to offer testimony to be uh, put out there for, for the public. They don't wanna meet in public where it would be very inconvenient for them to have people come in. And you know, I've, I have had bills go through ways and means before and I was required to be there as the bill author and there was testimony offered. So please don't tell us that the tradition is to never allow because uh, when one of my bills went through committee, you know who was the chair of Ways and Means? Lynn Carlson. Lynn Carlson was there and uh, he had the gavel and there was testimony taken. So I, I think that once again, and Representative Albright and I have talked about this lately, just a complete abrogation from the house rules because you, you find them to be inconvenient. Now, I'd like to, to change gears to um, Representative Becker Finn's commentary on the fact that we are the legislature and we've been making policy. And please eschew the, the irony of that because we're not. We are the legislature, but we have not been making policy. Uh, the, the governor has and the triumvirate has and commissioners in rooms have been, have been dictating policy. And, and it pains me to say that because I consider Chair Becker Finn, a friend, and we've worked on some issues together, but the legislature is not <laughs> creating the policy. The governor for many, many months has been snapping his fingers and creating policy. So please, Madam Chair, listen to the wisdom of all of us that have been offering this. We should be meeting in public. And just because folks wanna sit around their desk, uh, perhaps in pajamas, sipping coffee and eating breakfast during a Zoom call, that does not make us better. And to that point, I was walking around the Capitol uh, yesterday as floor debate was, was going on and days prior, and it might shock you to hear that there were people there. There were people walking around and I stopped one and asked if I could offer some help. And uh, the person said, well, thank you. Uh, you know, what do you do here? I said, well, I'm a legislator. I serve in the House of Representatives. And she said, oh, I'm so glad to see that you people are meeting in person. Well, I didn't quite drop a full knowledge bomb on, on her that we only meet on the floor and the House Republicans are there because we believe that there's value in being in person, but the DFL doesn't show up in full force. And it would, it would pain me to have to have told her that now, uh, realistically, the, the last committee stop along the way, ways and means, uh, we're not we're not meeting in person and we're not gonna be taking public testimony, which is a complete abrogation of both history and house rules. So please do the right thing, Madam Chair, and uh, begin calling us into an in-person meeting and follow the rules that we all adopted and voted for. Thank you. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, hang on one second here. I'm just going to turn down my other computer because I'm multitasking, which I usually am doing these days, often for many hours a day. I, I just really want to react to a couple of things that I've heard here. Um, you know, I've been in the majority and in the minority as uh, Representative Hansen has, we came in at the same time. Representative Garofalo knows this too. 
And we know that the job of the minority, at least uh, certainly this minority, is to slow things down. To slow things down, sometimes just it seems like the, uh, the object is just to make government not work, to make things fail, and certainly to say that everything the majority does is just bad, no matter what it is. If we do, if it's black, it's bad. If it's white, it's bad. We could switch to black, it's bad again. Switch to white, it's bad again. That's what this is about. But I really have to react to this one. You know, most of the time I just sit quietly and listen to it and let the blah, blah, blah go on. Criticize, criticize, criticize. But today, I heard one of the members say that legislators are lazy and that the public is not well served. And boy, does that make me angry. Because you know what, legislators? It is June 22nd. June 22nd. How long have we been working? Pretty much without a break. You know what? This is supposed to be a part-time legislature. Part-time. We get a part-time salary. Many of us have other jobs. Some of us like to go on vacation when we're not in session. Some of us have families visiting that we would like to spend time with. Some of us have a kid's birthday party. And I'm not even talking now about our staff, our staff who come to our legislature believing that this is a job where there's an off season. And I want members to think about this now. This is nobody's fault. We have had a pandemic, a pandemic. And when we came into session back in January, of a year ago, nobody knew there was going to be a pandemic. And we and our staffs, staffs have worked through the pandemic, and we continued to work special session after special session. And we continued into this session now. And some of us were, you know, there was an election in between, but those of us who were here in the last term, we were here. We've been working, we've been working, we've been working. And if you're in the minority, I get it. You could be lazy because the minority doesn't have much of the responsibility. You can take on responsibility. You can do work if you want to, but you don't have to. You don't have the responsibility to govern. But people in the majority have been working their tails off, especially those who have committee leadership responsibilities. So I heard legislators are lazy. I resent that. I highly resent that, Representative Scott. Do not tell me that. That is simply a lie. Do not say that to us because we are working our tails off and we're happy to do it because the, the state of Minnesota needs it. But to say that the state is not well served, oh my God. The public servants in this state are fantastic. And I'm talking about our staff who work for far too little money and are doing far more than they should ever be expected to do. They're working hours that are unbelievable and they're smart and they work hard. And it is absolutely a disservice to say that, even though I know the minority is supposed to criticize. Okay, that is so unfair. And then secondly, I really, I really just have to respond to this idea that the governor is making policy. That is complete 100% BS, at least in every area that I am aware of. And if the governor was making the policy, we wouldn't be working as hard as we are. So let's get rid of that, blah, 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 because that is an absolute untruth, absolute untruth. And when you just listen to Representative Hansen, explain his bill. He knows every detail of that bill. If the governor was writing that policy, he would not know every detail of that bill. He has dug in and done the work and given up family time as every chair has in this legislature. And because we're doing this remotely, I'll tell you what, this allows me to do about three times as much work and to work many more hours than I would otherwise. So let's just get rid of this mythology. I am sick to death of hearing this. We sit on the House floor and we listen to you guys talk, blah, 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 and waste everybody's time as though there was time to waste. We have a lot of business to do and we need to serve the public. So stop wasting time and let's get to it. Thank you, Madam Chair.
Thank you, Chair Lee. You said a lot that I was going to say, but I knew you would say it so much better. Madam um, Chair, this is Representative well, Nash. I just well, point out that I believe, me, well, Representative Nash, excuse me. I believe our motivations were just excuse called me, into question. I Nash, encourage I was, you to not allow that in your floor, in your committee debate. Representative Nash, I, I was speaking. You know, I, I tried to run a respectful committee and I want us to stay in that respectful lane. I think that is really important. So, but I do want to thank uh, uh, Chair Liebling because we work terribly hard here and we're only Zooming because of the pandemic. And historically within the Ways and Means Committee that these bills have been vetted and historically we do not have testimonies. And once this bill leaves the Ways and Means Committee, chairs are holding informational hearings where the public has the opportunity to chime in during those hearings as, as they would in Ways and Means or any other committee. That is what's happening with this process. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, I, I have some comments, but I would like to ask you uh, with regard to the uh, notification for our meeting this morning. Uh, I note on the uh, notice on the House website that uh, meeting is going to be held in accordance with House Rule 10.01. It also says members of the public with questions about this process may contact committee staff at chris.mccall at house.min. Written testimony may be submitted by email to chris.mccall at house.min for distribution to the committee. Chair Moran, nowhere in this notification does it invite nor disclose the opportunity for uh, audible public testimony, which is a contradiction from the availability uh, in years past where in my experience, having uh, been a, uh, a member of this committee for the last nine years, there has been, there always has been an opportunity for public testimony to be provided. So my twofold question before I have some uh, following comments is, are we to understand by the website that you do not accept public oral testimony to any bill? Or is it at the request after they contact the CA for the committee? And if so, has, has anyone contacted uh, your CA with a request to provide public testimony on this bill or any others in the past two weeks as an example? And I do have some uh, completing, uh, concluding comments. Uh, Representative Albright, <clears throat> you know, as uh, a first term chair of Ways and Means, you know, I had a privilege of having a conversation with a rep, uh, former Representative Lynn Carson, who has the art of chairing and definitely chairing the Ways and Means Committee. And in, now, in that conversation with him and many others that I've had and held with him, that uh, traditionally the Ways and Means Committee have not have maybe very, very seldom, very, very seldom do not have public testimonies because the bills that are moving through this body has gone to other respective committees. And within those committee, public testimony has taken place. Thorough vetting of the bill pros, cons, all have been discussed in other committees. So once it reaches the Ways and Means Committee, it's the discussion of the day is not about the bill, it's just a policy piece, the fiscal part of it that moves out of Ways and Means. And so you are correct. Uh, Mr. McCall, as the CA has placed for the public to 
provide a written testimony if they so choose to do that. That has been the protocol of this committee that people can submit written um, testimonies. And if they do, that those testimonies are shared with committee members. It's an open process that we have uh, made a part of the, of, of the Ways and Means Committee um, until today, that is the process. Representative Albright. Madam Chair. Representative Albright. Thank you. Um, with, with all due respect, Madam Chair, the process that these bills have uh, undertaken to get to this point is unlike anything else that any member of this committee or any other legislature has experienced. You cited yourself that we are living in very interesting times because of the pandemic. And as I would note, this is literally the first vetting of this bill before a committee in the House. Now, some would suggest, well, it came off the floor uh, and went to conference committee. That was under regular session. Then we turned to working groups. And then we moved to uh, a chair in the House and a chair in the Senate. And uh, to some extent, uh, commissioners uh, with uh, involvement in the provisions in the bill that were involved as well. So, Madam Chair, quite literally, this is the first vetting of this bill before a body of legislators in the House of Representatives to listen to this bill. And so whether you want to have this conversation here or the Committee of the Whole on the House floor to comments made by Representative Liebling, where the assertion was made that we just are speaking ad nauseum uh, to slow down the, the process to, uh, if you will, filibuster because we're in the minority. And, and while I, I certainly um, appreciate the, the work and the, and the, and the energy that uh, the chairs are putting into these uh, bills, I take great offense, Representative Liebling, when you suggest that the more minority doesn't have to govern. How dare you? I have an election certificate that is as much warranted and has as much merit as you do. And for you to suggest that my position in the minority is any less important than yours as a member of the majority and as a chair of a, of a committee, I really hope that you would rethink that statement. Because as a member of the minority, our job, Representative Liebling, is to point out the issues that have been brought up because of the content of those bills, to point out the flaws, to point out the concerns that members of the community have brought to our attention that you might either be tone deaf to or are not availed of. To suggest that we are lazy and that we don't have to do anything because we're just in the minority. I, 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 I'm, I'm shocked as a long-standing member of the legislature that you would take that tone with the minority. You yourself even said that you've been a representative in the minority as well as in the majority. I have witnessed your candor and your capabilities as a member of the minority. We're doing nothing less than what you would have done had the roles been reversed in this current biennium. Madam Chair, this bill has enormous consequences for a great many of our constituents. It'll pass off of this floor because you have the votes, but I can assure you that the diligence and the responsibility of the minority to call out what we find as the issues 
that are most compelling to debate will be thoroughly and rigorously debated on the floor of the House for as long as we feel it is required to make that point. And I certainly hope that the majority would respect the role that the minority has in properly vetting any legislation that comes before this body. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Albright. And you know, there is there is a process that the public and those who have you know grave concerns about this bill could have sent a written testimony. And I would have expected to see an abundance of those written testimonies from uh, those who have concerns about this bill, uh, but that is not so. Um, and you know, we've, we've moved a little bit from this bill into um, not meeting in person. And I see we have a, a few folks who wants to talk about the need to meet, meet in person. Um, and I stated that um, we, it's something, it's something that, you know, since I, I see there's a, a great need for uh, members to want to be in person, that's something that I can take into consideration as we move forward. Um, and my hope is that we don't, you know, uh, I mean, you know, we all have roles to play and things that we must say or think we need to say, and, and I'm fine with everyone doing that who needs to speak. Um, but it's, it's not that um, being in person is something that I as chair um, have constantly decided not to do because it's not like we don't want to be transparent. I think this is a very transparent role that we're playing right now, whether we are in Zoom or in person. It is a transparent process. And so um, I, uh, I'm going to, I have four or five people who have their hands up who would like to speak. And I'm sure it's, it's, a, it's a, I don't know what it's about. So I'm just gonna allow folks to share what they need to share so that we can um, continue with the process that we are in in moving um, this bill out of committee. So with that, uh, Representative Nash. Yeah, Madam Chair, I, I'll apologize for interjecting earlier. I was very frustrated with the fact that uh, as we've seen on the floor in recent days that personalities were invoked previously and you know, for as many times as we have been chided on the floor for doing so, you allowed it to happen here in the committee. So I would encourage uh, you to not allow that in the committee and would just again point out that you know, we have permanent rules that we voted on that are supposed to allow people to offer testimony and we are ignoring those. Well, we aren't, you are. And I just think that that is something that is so counter to the, the oath that we've sworn to be the voice of the people here. And I, I think that we owe it to the, the people that we serve, both uh, individuals and um, companies that employ people. Uh, you know, I, I heard earlier that we were demonizing in, in many uh, respects, people who may want to register their, their dissatisfaction with some component of the bill or another. Well, those people uh, actually have a huge bearing on how our state runs and what it does and the folks that are employed and whatnot. So, you know, please don't think that just when, when we're trying to get people to testify that it's uh, big, bad corporations that some people would like to, to make it all about. There are individuals who do have impacts from components of this bill that would like to register either their support or their dissatisfaction, and they haven't been afforded that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Nash. Uh, Representative Hurtoff. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I just wanted to respond to a very uh, passionate soliloquy about what is going on. And 
I, um, I just uh, think it's inappropriate to suggest as legislators that being in the majority renders the minority irrelevant. I understand uh, the frustration and that the clock is running out. We all have concerns about that. But the mere suggestion that the minority voice is irrelevant and that we're wasting everybody's time is troubling. And to suggest that it is the conduct of one caucus versus another, uh, I remember very clearly when we were in the majority for four years, and I remember all of the same type of endless speeches going on as well. You know, Madam Chair, those of us who have held office for some time, we find oftentimes that the general constituency, and, and I say this in a more broad term, many people are very informed about their government and take an active role and participation in it, even though they do not hold election certificate. But when we do go out, and I'm sure this is true of of uh, both sides of the aisle here, you go out and you find out how little folks really do know and understand how it works in St. Paul. And so when we have majorities, uh, most folks think that bills are authored, that they're entitled to a hearing, that they get a hearing, that we have a robust discussion about it, and that bills are even moved to the general register and get an up or down vote. And when it's explained how majorities and the power of the legislature is all stacked against the minority, that, that the committee slots are two to one, that virtually you have little or no chance of moving things forward unless there is some bipartisan agreement. So, you know, it is just frustrating to, to hear that our concerns don't matter. And when references are made to wasting time, I recall just a few weeks ago during the regular session, I think it was during the public safety bill that we heard third reading speeches from the majority for probably an hour and a half or two hours before we even got into the details of the bill. A rather peculiar arrangement that the membership and the majority had long speeches on this issue. And let's forget about what the subject matter was. That's not the point here. The point is, is that it does happen. And we all do have election certificates. We choose to run and hold office because we do care about our districts. We care about our constituents. We care about representing all of our members uh, of our community, not just Republicans or not just Democrats. And those of us who have been here some time certainly have tried to earn the respect of members on the other side of the aisle that goes for you, it goes for uh, other members of the majority, as well as uh, our members. And so I think some of us do come with a servant's heart in wanting to do the best for Minnesota. But if this task or burden of holding an election certificate is just too inconvenient for the issues at hand, that we're supposed to be representing the concerns of our constituency, if it's just too convenient, then you, we shouldn't be in office. We should resign. We should simply let somebody else do the task. And so, um, honestly, you know, even in my own case, I came with a servant's heart, figuring I would serve one or two terms. But then you suddenly realize that there are things about participating in the process and in the legislature that do take time. And it does take time to build relationships and trust with other members. And uh, so I look forward that, that we leave this meeting today with, with a little bit different attitude about what is necessary. But as you know, when you're in the minority and when we're in the minority, the minority, no matter who it is, has a limited amount of leverage to 
to get the attention of the majority to address some of their concerns. Otherwise, it's just a matter of being steamrolled over. Slam bam, thank you, ma'am. This is the way it is. Too bad. You're in the minority. So I think all of us as legislators rise to a little bit higher uh, element in terms of cooperating with each other. And with that, uh, I will end it, Madam Chair, but I wasn't going to speak until I heard that soliloquy. It's just unnecessary. If you're frustrated, you're frustrated. I get it, but this is not the place. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak a little bit about the process, which for me, the process is probably more important than, than even the outcome sometimes. And what I've, what I've heard you say is that um, Ways and Means generally doesn't take testimony uh, because it is usually vetted by committees and, and has been heard. And, and whereas I can maybe understand that justification during regular session, I wouldn't agree with it, but I, I could at least understand it. In the special session, especially this one, uh, I don't believe that's anywhere near true because the bills coming to us have never reached any committee whatsoever and instead have been negotiated by two people at at least uh, three, maybe four at, at times, sent to the revisers and then brought to us. Now, why is that important? Because from here, it's going to be going to the general registry and onto the house floor and the house floor, we do not accept testimony uh, uh, from that. So. So there has been no uh, input uh, available. And what I've heard you say is that, well, that's okay because informational meetings are being heard after this. And so then public can have input there. Well, to paraphrase that and put it into a context that I think we can all understand, that would be like saying a judge uh, deciding a court case would say, well, I'm not gonna take any evidence at this point because um, people can, do that next week. Instead, I'm going to make the decision, send it up to the Supreme Court, which doesn't take testimony either. Uh, but it's okay because you guys can provide your evidence next week. Well, that doesn't really equate to having input into the decision. Most people, when they're wanting to put input into a bill, believe that it has some weight given to that testimony before the decision is made making the decision first and then asking for input really isn't asking for any input. So my, my request is that if you could at least please confer that to your leadership uh, and help them understand that people are frustrated. They're not gonna give input after the fact and making it difficult to give input uh, because of the shortness of time in which it's being presented and uh, reported is also not very well taken. So. Just food for thought that you know this process is not working well, and it certainly is not as tr transparent that we would like it. And if you were in our shoes, you wouldn't like it either. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Petersburg. Uh, <clears throat> let me just say that you're right. This has been a very strange session, and you know traditionally, you know we were in session and ended on time. When it doesn't happen, you know, we find ourselves where we are right now. But, you know, we will have committees going to a conference, you know, and we even tried that after session. They will go into a conference committee and they will go and look at same and similar and, and adopt things. You know, they will meet, they will meet in person, they will stay at the table until they get their work done. But that's been a refusal this year for that type of process to happen where folks are just like refusing to meet. The house is ready to meet and they're going on vacation. And so some committees have just not been able to finish their work with in the regular conference committee type of environment. The one that we know, the one that has been around, one that most of us have been a part of, that just makes sense. You know, in doing a, you know, a traditional process, we would have been on the House floor right now and this bill would have came back from conference committee and we would have voted and been done. But that has not happened. 
Not only has the pandemic been strange and weird, but so has this process. And so here we are where leadership had to interject and some of the policies have changed. And so here we are back in ways and means, which traditionally we wouldn't be here. And the process that we have created is that they will, bills will come back to ways and means because the fiscal piece of it has changed, you know, through processes. And that we created another piece before sending it to the House floor, which is an informational hearing where the public, yes, after it leaves here, we'll have an opportunity to share. We can't change it because this has been an unprecedented type of process, but it is where we are right now because we are in a special session and we do not want government to shut down. That is our priority is to make sure that government do not shut down and we can do the people's work and make sure after people have gone through all type of trauma through these last 15 months that we are not shutting down government and people are losing their jobs or on furlough from their jobs. So here we are. And the, the good, the bad, the ugly and all that. And so that's the process we created to, to get some more information to share with uh, the public where we are, what, you know, and chairs would do that through the informational hearing and it will go to the house floor for a vote. And if all goes well, we would do this before June 30th because government will shut down on July 1st if we do not. And so we're all hardworking legislators. That's what I believe, doing our part to represent our district, to represent the state, to represent all people because we have to see all people. Madam Chair, may, may I follow up just quickly? Who is, who is that? Uh, Representative Petersburg. Yes, uh, 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 in one second, Representative Petersburg. And so I just wanted to share that because as much, I think we're all frustrated and tired. We're working extremely hard. We're working very long hours. My CA, Chris McCall, <laughs> It's not only my CA, but has been working tirelessly with Health and Human Service. Tirelessly. Not getting any sleep, not eating, trying to make sure that we're here in this committee today after a long night. This is tough work. This is hard work. And we have to appreciate the time that people are giving of themselves. And that is what we're doing here. And so I'm just gonna stop because we need, we, we have to move along. We just have to. Um, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And it sounds like um, you're as frustrated with this process as, as most of us are, uh, but the reality is, is that the majority is in charge of the process. The majority is in charge of the way the process is going. And eventually the accountability will have to be with, with the majority. And, and frustration that we're feeling right now is, is shared by both sides. And, we just need to accept responsibilities where they are. Uh, I myself, in just a, an hour or so, will be taking my wife for a lab test for uh, chemotherapy th tests. So we all have challenges in front of us and we need to um, uh, continually moving forward without, um, without all of this uh, irate discussion. Instead, just understand that we all are accountable and we have, we have to be, hold ourselves accountable. Thank you, Madam Chair. Absolutely. And with that, in my accountability, we have Representative Tim Miller, who is next, and then we're going to go for a vote. Uh, Representative Tim Miller. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, uh, members, I, I understand the nerves are getting raw. Uh, I think we it's probably shown up in other places in recent days. It's certainly showing up here. Um, and I, that's, I guess that's almost part of the process. That's part of the process also. Uh, um, so I, I think we do need to all give each other some grace, uh, but that but grace doesn't doesn't keep us from our responsibilities either. And in some ways, I think at times like this, that's kind of the balance between the two. 
I, I only wanted to make a comment. Um, uh, um, I don't I don't think anyone in this room or at the legislature right now can accuse me of being an obstructionist. Um, I've had the governor both privately and publicly say uh, very positive things about me. I've had the speaker privately mostly say very positive things about me, probably to my detriment in my own party. OK, um, so I hope that gives me some position to be able to say something without sounding like I'm just trying to string things along. That's why I say that. And uh, Chair Liebling, uh, I know you're on two, so if, if you're not listening, I'll just uh, assume you're listening. Um, you're, you're a senior member here, you're respected. Uh, maybe some people have that respect in a positive sense and a not positive sense, but there's no argument that people believe that you really know your stuff. Um, but, I, but, I, but I do take exception that uh, when I hear in your frustration, uh, that my words are reduced or the people that I'm trying to represent or speak are reduced to blah, blah, blah. I heard that multiple times. And um, this system that we have is, is, can be an ugly and beautiful art, but it's an art form, it's not a science. And so we're dealing with people <clears throat> and we have, to, we have to muddle through these things sometimes. The, the one sense that I have and the one challenge that I do give to you, Chair Moran, I, I feel like this some of this should be expanded to the broader body, but so I'll keep it specific because we're in ways and means, I'll keep it to this. The one challenge that I do give to you, Chair Moran, is uh, at kind of at the beginning of this run here, this sequence, uh, Representative Garofalo, you know, had exhorted the importance of us meeting in person and other, people's have, other people have expressed that. I think that's a priority now. Um, there will be some nuisance with it, as always is. But I, I just hear our system, it's just, kind of, it, it's just kind of giving way at the seams a little bit. Um, and we need to do the best that we can to at least get back to the process that we know as uncomfortable as it may be in the sausage making and all this other stuff we talk about, but that we get back to that. The Ways and Means Committee, I, I know that I understand that we don't have a better way during special session except for to move things through Ways and Means, but that puts a lot of pressure and a lot of responsibility on this committee to get things done the right way in ways that I personally can step away from and be proud of. I might not like all of it. I might get frustrated with it myself, but three weeks from now, after, after I have a little bit of rest and um, have a little bit of perspective. I can say, you know what, the process worked there. Uh, I think you're hearing that frustration, Madam Chair. Um, uh, but please get us back. We're not trying to get in person for yet a new angle to try and drag things out. I can tell you from me personally, that's not the case. I think we need to do that. I think because the process is bringing us basically narrowed down into ways and means for all this stuff that adds a burden to all of us. But you don't, you're not on ways and means if you haven't been around and you're not on ways and means if you're not capable of doing the extra work. We all want to do it. Uh, as the lay of the land, I can't, I can't do a roll call in my mind of Ways and Means Committee, but as the lay of the land in general, the minority lives further away from, uh, from the capital than does the majority. And you're hearing the minority saying, we'll give up our things, we'll be in a room and we'll do that. I think that should speak very loudly to you. Um, I did come home last night, but if we had this meeting at 8.30 in person, I would have called my wife and said, I'll have to be back tomorrow because I need to be in person. I think all of us want to do that. So Madam, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll, I'll end with that, but just please, you are responsible for this committee. That's probably an unfair burden given the circumstances, but please get us back to the system that works best for all of us. Thank you. I hear you, Representative Miller. I hear you guys, I hear you. Okay, so we're going to close with Representative Garofalo. Um, who I see hand just came up, but Representative uh, closes out and we're gonna go to a vote. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And first of all, I did wanna echo your comments, thanking Mr. McCall uh, for his work. Uh, certainly, I, I know that from my experience, staff absolutely hates it when we say their name in committee, uh, <laughs> but they do put it, they do start earlier than us, they stay later than us. 
Uh, they put a lot of time in and they have to be flexible in terms of scheduling a schedule they can't keep that we make for them. So I do want to thank him for his really good work staffing this, as well as our nonpartisan research and members on the Republican side of the aisle, uh, specifically Harry Kennedy and on this bill, Amy Zipko. All of us really appreciate the work you guys put in and we don't always make it easy for you. So thank you. Um, uh, in closing, Madam Chair, I think it's important to recognize that our system of government is one where we allow all voices to be heard, um, not just the voices of those in the political majority. And so I would hope that you take those comments to heart and I hope that our, hope ne our next committee hearing uh, is an in-person committee hearing. I'll be voting no on today's bill, but as always, thank you to the members for their work on this bill. Thank you. With that. <clears throat> Madam Chair, can I, can I close on yes, my bill? Yeah, absolutely, uh, Chair Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, a couple uh, quick comments. Uh, as the chair noted, and as I noted earlier, uh, provisions of this bill have been held up for over a year, and July 1st is coming quickly. Um, that means that we had to compromise, and there are a lot of compromises in this bill. A couple of the compromises I'm very concerned about. I'm very concerned about the compromise on addressing the crisis of chronic wasting disease in Minnesota. I'm worried that because we don't have the house provisions on policy in here, that the money that we will spend will be ineffective. It's hard to have two bosses. So I think that we are not at the end of addressing chronic waste and disease. We are in the middle of this journey and more will be need to be done in the future. I am concerned about the manure provision that forcing that will actually result in the federal government looking at how we do water quality protection in our state. But we have to accept those provisions in order to get the bill done. And so Senator Ingebrigtsen and I negotiated the language on the PFAS and food packaging. There were some comments about switching and including and changing and other people being involved. This was language, the language that is included went through the process and is included in the bill. And what is being asked now is for intervention to change the language that had gone through the process. Now, Representative Liebling was right. She and I and Representative Garofalo and Representative Lilly all came in together. We've seen a lot over those years. But what I remember is that we represent people. We are supposed to represent the people who elect us. The poor and the disaffected and those that have no voice. The well-off and the well-connected always have a voice at government. And they are trying to exercise their voice now and change an agreement. And if the agreement on the PFAS and food packaging is changed, then there is no honor in the system. If I'm speeding and I go past the speeding sign and I'm stopped and I say, I didn't see the speeding sign, I'm still going to get caught for speeding. It's our responsibility to read our bills. It's our responsibility to know our bills. It's our responsibility to pass the bills. And these bills have been vetted. So I'm asking for your vote. A lot of the debate today was on process. And there is an expectation in Minnesota government that those with access to power can get what they want. I don't think Minnesotans want to eat PFAS. Don't think so, sorry. I think if they could speak on it, they'd probably tell us that. But we as the elected representatives are supposed to be their voice here, not the stakeholders. The stakeholders can make their case and they're used to making it and they will always make it. But we have to look at ourselves and say, who do we represent? 
And with that, I ask for your vote and support. Thank you, Chair Hansen. There being no further discussion to the bill, Chair Hansen renews his motion that House File 5, as amended, be recommended for placement on the general register. Ms. Sparkman, please take the roll. Chair Moran? Aye. Moran, aye. Vice Chair Olson? Aye. Olson, aye. Representative Garofalo? Garofalo, no. Garofalo, no. Representative Albright? No. Albright, no. Please Representative Beckerfin? No. Beckerfin, aye. Beckerfin, aye. Representative Bernardi? Unless aye. Happens soon. Bernardi, aye. Representative Eklund? Aye. Eklund, aye. Representative Hansen? Aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Hassan? Hassan, aye. Hassan, aye. Representative Hurtas? Hey, no. Hurtas, no. Representative Hornstein? Hornstein, aye. Hornstein, aye. Representative Johnson? Representative Johnson? Representative Cresha? Cresha, no. Cresha, no. Representative Liebling? Liebling, aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Lilly? Aye. Lilly, aye. Representative Mariani? Representative Mariani? Mariani, aye. Mariani, aye. Representative Marquart? Marquart, aye. Marquart, aye. Representative Miller? Miller, no. Miller, no. Representative Nash? Nash, no. Nash, no. Representative Nelson? Nelson, aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Noor? Noor, aye. Noor, aye. Representative O'Neill? O'Neill, no. O'Neill, no. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, aye. Pulowski, aye. Representative Petersburg? Petersburg, no. Petersburg, no. Representative Pinto? Pinto, aye. Pinto, aye. Representative Schumacher? Schumacher, no. Schumacher, no. Representative Schultz? Schultz, yes. Schultz, aye. Representative Scott? Scott, no. Scott, no. Representative Sundin? Sundin, aye. Sundin, aye. Representative Johnson? Johnson, no. Johnson, no. There are 18 ayes and 11 nays. So there have been 18 ayes and 11 nays. The motion prevails. House file five as amended is recommended for placement on the general register. Thank you, Chair Hansen. So members, we are going to take a recess and we will let people know if, if and when we are reconvening later in the day to hear additional bills. Please watch your email. Um, this may be very, very short notice for folks who need to travel from your district here. So it may not happen with this next meeting in person, but again, watch your email. The committee stands in recess to the call of the chair. Thank you, bye-bye.